So our plan for today is uh, primarily we're going to focus on what I'll refer to as non-parametric few shot learning methods. Uh, this is a pretty cool class of methods that actually seems to uh, work really, really well for uh, few shot classification problems. And it will also be part of homework two, uh, in addition to some of the topics that we had covered on Monday. We'll also look at a, a case study in education where we actually deployed these systems for uh, a real live application, which was pretty exciting. Um, and then once we kind of talk about these, this class of methods, we'll also talk a little bit, um, start to kind of wrap up this kind of module on, on meta-learning algorithms by talking about a comparison of the three different classes of approaches that we've talked about, um, and also give a few different example applications. Um, so really the goals by the end of the lecture are to get an understanding for what this third class of meta-learning methods is, um, and understand how to implement these uh, non-parametric few-shot meta-learning methods. Um, and then also start to understand the trade-offs between different meta-learning algorithms and some of the applications of these algorithms. Cool. Um, so to briefly recap, um, the last two lectures we've talked about black box meta-learning and optimization-based meta-learning. And in black box meta-learning, we parameterize the learning process with something like a big black box recurrent neural network by passing in a training data set into that neural network having it output a set of parameters and having a new example be passed into that um, and kind of training this whole system end to end with respect to the ability to generalize to new data points. Um, this is what you've been implementing in homework one. It's a very expressive approach in that it can represent lots of different learning procedures, uh, but it can also be somewhat challenging to optimize and somewhat sensitive to hyperparameters. Then on the lecture on Monday, we talked about optimization-based meta-learning algorithms that embed the structure of gradient descent into the inner loop learning process. And um, we saw that uh, these algorithms are, um, because they're embedding the structure of optimization inside this learning process, um, you get that nice structure. And so at initialization, you're already going to be getting something that can do at least a little bit of learning from the examples that you give it. Um, but it does require a second order optimization, and this can be computationally more heavyweight, um, especially in comparison to some of the approaches that we'll be talking about today. Cool. Um, so really what we'd like to be able to do today is we'd like to be able to take a learning procedure um, and embed that inside the inner loop process of these meta-learning algorithms without requiring a second order optimization. And the way that we're going to do that is instead of trying to embed gradient descent into these algorithms, we're going to look at algorithms like nearest neighbors. Um, and in particular, you might think, okay, well, nearest neighbors is not a very powerful algorithm, so why, why might we actually do anything like nearest neighbors? Um, but things like nearest neighbors, these non-parametric machine learning methods actually work uh, pretty well if you are in a low data regime. Um, if you have a small amount of data, then these algorithms are uh, computationally efficient because you don't have that many comparisons to be making. Um, and they're also very simple. Um, and at meta test time, when we're trying to do something like few shot learning, we're actually in a low data regime. And so things like nearest neighbors may actually make a lot of sense. Um, however, during meta, meta training time, we actually potentially have a large number of tasks and we want to be able to learn um, good representations from the data that we have, and so we still want to be parametric during meta training time. And so really the kind of the, the idea behind the class of methods that we'll talk about today is trying to use kind of parametric meta learners that produce effective non-parametric learners. Um, so it might be a little bit mysterious uh, what that exactly means, so let's get into it a little bit. So, um, say we want to do kind of the canonical few shot image classification problem that we've look at, been looking at before. Uh, if we want to do something like nearest neighbors with this example, what we would do is we would take our test data point and we would compare it to each of our training examples. And once we figured out what, which of the training examples it was most similar to, then we can output the label of that training example. Um, so this is pretty simple. Uh, we're just going to be comparing our test image with each of the images in the training data set for our given task. Now, the key question is, uh, when we make these comparisons, in what 
space do we compare? Uh, or what distance metric are we going to be using to compare these images? Um, now, one thing you could imagine doing is doing L2 distance in pixel space. So just doing uh, kind of Euclidean distance in the original space of the images. Um, and so if you do something like that, um, say you were to compare this image on the right with the two images on the left, um, just with this, this L2 distance. I'm curious what you think would be uh, kind of the closer of the two images. Uh, how many people think that the left image would be closer in terms of L2 distance? And how many people think the right image? Okay, so maybe people like maybe people are trying to, but in general there wasn't any, any sort of consensus. But it turns out that this left image is actually in L2 space what's going to be closer uh, to this image on the right, uh, and at least perceptually in terms of what when we see these images, at least the image on the right is something that we would probably want to be closer in um, in terms of our distance metric. So things like L2 distance are actually really terrible uh, for comparing in the original space of things like images. Um, so we don't want to use L2 distance. Does anyone have ideas for what distance metrics we might consider using instead of L2 distance? Yeah? You the first five layers of BGG-19 and you use there for the symmetry. That's very specific. Uh, so you could use you could use the embeddings from a, kind of a trained neural network, perhaps the the fifth layer of the VGG network. Um, yeah. Learn the metric with the training data. Yeah. So maybe you can learn the metric with the training data. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Extract key points. Mm -hmm. So you could try to extract some key points in the image and compare those, uh, the key points across the, the images. Yeah? I mean, similar to the like, combination of things that people said, if you know your target picture, you could pull out of the row and layer and maybe do like cosine similarities because it's a huge uh, feature space. Yeah, so you could do something like cosine similarity in a certain feature space. This isn't a suggestion, but I just feel like I'm missing something. If we're talking about choosing a distance metric, is it not a parameter? Like, in what sense is this a non-parametric metric? Yeah, um, so the question was, um, if we're choosing the distance metric, isn't that a parameter of the method? And so in what sense is this a non-parametric method? Um, and so, yeah, that's exactly right. The kind of the choice of distance function is going to be parametric. And in this case, we're actually going to be learning um, a distance metric, which was what was suggested. That's kind of the parametric part of it. But once you have that distance metric, the rest is, is non-parametric, so you're going to be kind of comparing um, in that space. So once you embed into some embedding space, everything after that is, is non-parametric. And so it's, it is going to be something that's a little bit more hybrid. The meta-learning process will be parametric and have some parameters that you're optimizing. Um, and then once you optimize those parameters, um, at test time there isn't going to be um, any kind of notion of task parameters. And we'll see that a little bit when we get into some of the math. Cool. So um, yeah, the key idea behind this class of methods is maybe we can learn how to compare examples using the meta training data. So there's three specific methods that we'll go into. Um, and we'll start with the simplest one, which is uh, referred to as a Siamese network. So a Siamese network is a, a pretty simple neural network architecture where you um, have two inputs and you pass those two inputs into the same exact, uh, the same exact neural network. Um, and it's called the Siamese network because these kind of two neural networks have the same exact parameters. So the parameters are shared across the two. Um, and what we'll do is we'll pass in two images into the Siamese network. Um, and then once we have the output, we'll then compare these, the, the resulting representation. And we'll train the Siamese neural network to output whether or not the two images we're passing in have the same class or not. And so in this example, uh, these two images have a different class. One is of a lion, one is of cups or bowls. And so the label will be zero because these are a different class. Um, likewise, we could pass it these two images, which are both images of bowls, and we would train it to output one. 
uh, and so on and so forth. So whenever we give it two images that are different classes, we train it to output zero. Whenever they're both the same class, we train it to output one. Um, so the training process is a very simple binary classification problem. And you can do this with all of the kind of available meta training data that you have. Cool. And then once you have the Siamese neural network, what you can do is use this as essentially your similarity metric or your distance metric. So you can compare each of the, um, you can compare your test image to each of the examples in your training data set and ask this network which of the images is the closest. And so in particular, um, if we kind of go back to the example you had before, you would pass in all pairs of, of training example comma test data point and ask it which has the highest probability of being the same class and then output the corresponding label. Any questions on how that works? Cool, so training will be binary classification and test time, you're running these pairwise comparisons and so if you have um, n times k examples in your training data set, you're gonna be um, actually doing n times k forward passes of this neural network uh, and, finding, and then finding the probability that's the highest and then outputting the corresponding label. Um, so meta training is binary classification and then meta test time will actually be a form of n-way classification. Yeah. There aren't more than one short learning thing, I don't think. So you're asking this can't work for one shot learning? Why can't it work for one shot learning? Like if you only have one example of each class, then like if you compare it to just that class, the neural network will just learn to predict identity or like kind of like that. So similar to what we saw in the previous two lectures, you um, you need to have at least one example per class in your training data in your in your meta training data set. Um, and so in your meta training data set, you need to make sure that you're not, um, that for example, you sample two images per character or two images per class. Uh, and that ensures that you're actually going to train it to generalize versus, um, for example, if you pass in the same exact image into the network, it would just learn to memorize and learn how to predict whether or not they're exactly the same image or whether they're slightly different images. Cool. So. Now, one thing that's like not super appealing about this kind of approach is that we actually have this mismatch between what's happening at meta train time and what's happening at meta test time. Um, and so, in particular, if you're actually to kind of write out what happens at meta test time, you're gonna get something where um, basically you're taking, we'll call this neural network F or F theta. Um, you're going to be comparing the test example with um, one of with, with each of your training examples, so you'll be looking at this for each of the x k in your training data set, and you can essentially view um, what's happening at meta test time as, uh, well, asking this neural network whether or not um, kind of the probability that these match is greater than say zero point five, and if it is greater than zero point five, outputting the label corresponding to that training example. Um, so one way that you could s sort of write what's gonna be happening at, at um, meta test time would be something like this, where uh, you're summing over all of the examples in your training data set, comparing um, the test input to each of those training examples, and for the one that has the highest probability, then outputting the corresponding label. This isn't exactly correct, because the network might actually output multiple, like more than greater, greater than 0 0.5 for more than one of the examples. Um, but this is kind of approximately what it is doing and this will correspond to y hat, uh, y hat k, your prediction for, sorry, your prediction for uh, the test example. So y hat test. So now from this standpoint, um, if you view this as the, um, what's happening at meta test time, what you could imagine doing instead of doing binary classification during train time is formulating an equation like this and simply just back propagating into theta. And if we did something like that, then we could actually match what happens at meta training time and meta test time. 
Now, we can't do exactly that because this, um, this operator right here that's basically is kind of an indicator variable for whether or not the probability is above 0 0.5, it's going to be hard to differentiate through something like that um, because it's a, a hard operation. And so what you can do instead is do something softer where um, you simply uh, kind of multiply this probability by yk and sum over your examples in your training data set for a given task. And if we do something like this, this, this here we can actually back propagate through this loss. So this is going to be equal to y hat test. And you can actually optimize the parameters of this kind of, of this network right here with respect to how accurate you are on test examples. And so in particular, um, the way this algorithm would look like is very similar to the existing meta training algorithms that we have done before, where first you sample a task. Um, so this might, if we were doing three-way classification, this might correspond to, say, three characters. Second, we sample two images per character. And then we, for the training data set, this basically corresponds to, it gives us our training data set and our test set for that task. We plug in our training data set into this equation here to then get a um, kind of an estimate for, uh, as well as kind of our, our test example from the test set to get an estimate for the label. And then when we actually go to update theta, we're going to be looking at um, kind of comparing the, I guess I should write this more as cross entropy loss. So um, we'll be looking at, uh, what's the best way to, something like uh, y hat test log um, y test. I should have written this down before, but something, uh, I think the cross entropy loss is actually the opposite of this. Is this correct for cross entropy loss? Something like this. Um, and so then you'll be uh, minimizing uh, the kind of parameters of our, compar um, our, basically our comparator function with respect to how accurate your predictions are. So more specifically, what this will look like is um, this corresponds to something called matching networks. And what we're going to do is we're going to encode our training examples into um, some embedding space. And then for each of those embeddings, we will uh, compute this function that's, you could think of this as potentially taking the dot product between your embedding for x test and your embedding for uh, xk. And so in this diagram, um, you can think of each of these black dots as this function right here. And then each of these colored squares corresponds to the, to the label for that training example. We take the dot product between, um, between the, the black dots and the red or, or the colored squares, sum over each of the examples to ultimately get the um, the prediction for our test example. Yeah? Um, how well do uh, these methods work uh, with unseen classes at different time? So how will these methods work on unseen examples at inference time? So um, in general, as, as long as you train it on enough kind of the kinds of meta training scenarios that we've had before where you have enough kind of characters that you're training it on, um, it will actually generalize well to new image classes at test time. If you only train it on a few classes, then, then it will struggle to generalize. Yeah. Last of to other previous meta learning approaches are not parametric methods that constrain to classification tasks only because you cannot learn anything else right here. Yeah, so um, that's a great, a great observation. So these methods are restricted to classification tasks. Uh, things like nearest neighbors um, are 
specific to classification. And it's not, uh, it's not trivial to try to extend these kinds of ideas to regression problems. Yeah. Uh, why is the deep test not going through the same embedding space as the train? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, one thing you might notice that in this particular architecture, they use a different encoder for the test example than for the training examples. Um, that's mostly just a choice of their architecture. Uh, you could choose to, alt to put it through the same exact embedding space. And actually, in the method that we'll look at next, uh, they do actually choose to put it in the same exact embedding space. Um, one other note that I'll make about this architecture is that they, um, when they embed the training examples, um, they actually use, uh, this is a somewhat old paper, so they use a bidirectional LSTM. If they were designing this they, more recently, they'd probably use a bidirectional um, transformer model. And um, that means that when it actually computes this, it can actually take into account not just one example, but it's also kind of implicitly taking into account the other examples in your task training set. Um, but basically, at a high level, you can think of this method as embedding things, doing nearest neighbors in that embedding space, and then back propagating all the way into the parameters of your embedding function. Um, of course, we need to do that sort of nearest neighbors function in a soft way so that we could differentiate through it. And that's why um, we get a function that looks like this, where we are, um, rather than taking kind of this hard, um, this hard max, we're going to be taking more of something like a soft max. Um, so the whole thing is trained end to end. And this was really the first, um, one thing that's nice about this paper is it actually really emphasizes how you should really try to match what's happening at meta training time and meta test time. And they, they were able to get substantially better performance than um, something like Siamese networks. Cool. Um, so if we walk through the algorithm, um, we also did this somewhat on the board, but kind of more formally, um, it's very similar to the algorithms that we've seen for like the black box approach and the optimization based approach. Um, and what's different is just these, um, primarily just the third step, although also the fourth step. So um, in the third step, instead of actually explicitly computing parameters for the task, we're actually going to be kind of skipping that step and directly making predictions for the test examples. Um, you can view this as kind of integrating out the parameters, the, the task parameters, and hence why we're referring to these as non-parametric few-shot learning methods. Um, and then, of course, because we are, um, because we're just computing the, the test example, the test predictions directly, uh, instead of using a loss function in the form of step four, we're going to be updating the, param the meta parameters um, simply using a loss function that compares the predictions and the, uh, the labels. How does this generalize in the case where you have more than one, like, data point in your training is of the same table? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and that was actually the next question on my slide. So um, in particular, uh, the kind of question is, what happens if you have more than one, um, more than one example per class? Uh, so I guess I was actually thinking about posing this to you guys. So maybe does anyone want to answer that question? Yeah? You can compare the average embedding over different images. Of the same yeah, so um, one thing you could do is you can compare the average embedding. You're sort, sort of foreshadowing what happens next. Yeah? We could take a score for each class, count how many images have probability greater than 0.5, and the one the class which has the highest count, that could be the prediction. Yeah, and you, so you could do some sort of voting scheme, and in, in practice, that's actually what matching networks tends to do. So basically, you're going to be, um, this equation is still valid for scenarios where you have more than one example per class. Um, and essentially, each of these is going to vote on what the label is. And if you accumulate enough votes, then you will, um, the kind of the thing with the, the highest kind of accumulation of those scores um, will then kind of win the vote and get the label, um, get to be able to make the prediction for the label. Um, now, uh, there's a downside to this voting approach, which is that all of the votes are kind of cast somewhat independently of one another. Uh, and this means that you might have scenarios where um, 
where the kind of test example is maybe, maybe there's like one, um, one example with the incorrect label that actually has a very high vote, but everything else has a very low vote for that example. Um, and you might get examples essentially where the, um, where, um, where it, the kind of that overpowers the other kind of the actual correct label and doesn't give you exactly what you want. Um, as kind of one maybe rough example for what this might look like, um, you could sort of think of this as mimicking something uh, a lot like nearest neighbors. And there's a failure mode for nearest neighbors where um, if, for example, you have data um, that maybe looks something like this, where you have just a two-way classification problem, you're trying to classify between kind of positive and negative examples. Uh, if you end up getting an example uh, that say like right here, for example, um, this something like nearest neighbors will give you a negative prediction, even though there's a lot of positives in this general vicinity. And if instead of doing nearest neighbors, you kind of aggregate information across the, the examples into kind of what we'll refer to as a prototype for each class, then you can kind of start to mitigate that issue. So um, if you form, if you, if this is your embedding space and you average the embedding per class, you'll get kind of one prototype that is maybe kind of somewhere right here for the positive class. And you'll get one prototype that's somewhere uh, maybe around here for the negative class. And then if you compare your example to these prototypes, you'll then see that the, um, the kind of distance to the positive prototype is less than the distance to the negative prototype. And then you'll get something that's closer to the right answer. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind the last approach that we'll talk about, which is that instead of trying to perform these comparisons independently, we'll try to aggregate class information to create a prototypical embedding for each class and then compare the test example to those prototypical examples. So we'll just do nearest neighbors to the prototypes instead of nearest neighbors to the individual training examples. Um, cool, so um, what that looks like is basically exactly what's in this picture. Um, if you are actually to write it out in math, um, you'll get some, uh, you'll compute your prototype. We'll refer to this as uh, CN to match the picture. This will be basically just an average over an embedding of the examples for that class. And so if we take example, um, uh, I'll use XK here. Um, we will only want to average over the embeddings that correspond to class N. And so we're only going to do this summation over the examples where YK is equal to N. Um, and this is a summation over all of the examples in your training data set. Um, so this will just, this is basically just going from these blue pluses to the purple plus and the blue negatives for uh, to the to the purple negative. So this is a very simple average. And then once we have these prototypes, we can compute the distance between the prototype and the test example rather than looking at the distance between the individual examples. Um, and in practice, what this algorithm will do is once you compute these distances, then you'll just um, negate the distances to get a similarity score uh, and then take a softmax to ultimately get the probability that y hat for the test example is equal to class N. So written out on the slides, we're averaging over, we will embed all of our examples using the function f. Um, average those embeddings. And so unlike the previous slide, we're actually just going to be using the same exact embedding function for our training examples and our test example. Um, and then this is writing out the full softmax equation um, where we take the distance, we compute the distance between the example and the prototype, um, and the, then kind of exponentiate and normalize in order to compute a probability. 
so kind of what is that interesting? Yeah, so um, in the original paper, they use Euclidean distance or cosine distance as the distance function. Um, in practice, you could actually also learn a distance function somewhat similar to what matching networks does here as well. Um, and so instead of using, um, you could, this could be basically a learned network. Um, if it is learned, then it was going to have the, um, its parameters will be kind of a part of, you'll maybe have some additional parameters. Um, and when you run the meta training process, you're going to optimize over kind of, it would both be the parameters of f as well as the parameters of this distance function right here. Yeah? Can you explain again why the, there's like the minus d on um, the bottom, there's no minus D. Um, why there's a minus D here and why, oh, that's a typo on the slides, definitely. Yeah. That's a great catch. Um, so on the slide, um, that should be a minus D in the uh, denominator. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a paper that I'll mention a few slides from now called Relation Networks. Um, and they basically meta learn the distance function as well. Um, I think that on kind of the benchmark problems, they weren't seeing significant benefits from using a distance function over just using something like cosine similarity or, um, or Euclidean distance. And one reason to potentially expect to not see too many benefits is that F itself has a lot of expressive power to embed into whatever space you might want, and that's it going to impose different distance metrics. Uh, and so you may not actually need something on top of um, actually just embedding into this other space. Um, but I could also, it, it's possible that there are some applications where it's difficult to impose a certain metric space and where um, we're kind of learning something to output um, a probability is, is helpful. Cool. Um, actually, no. So it's actually on the right next slide. So this is the relation network pa paper. Um, they also do this sort of embedding, and then you um, you compare to them. Um, but then they lastly do this sort of um, have this kind of relation score that corresponds to this uh, this learned distance function. Now there are a couple of other things that you could do as well. So um, there might be some examples where some of your positive and negative examples are not easy to cluster nicely. So for example, if you're trying to classify between cats and dogs, you may have some breeds of cats that look a lot like dogs. And if you have something like that, then maybe you actually have kind of a cluster over here of negatives. And if your algorithm is having a lot of trouble actually getting, like finding a metric space where everything is clustered together nicely, um, you could also use something where you actually have a mixture of prototypes. Um, and that's what uh, this paper did here, is instead of actually just having one prototype per class, they actually had multiple prototypes per class. In a lot of examples, this isn't kind of critical for getting good performance, but it's something that's uh, worth mentioning. Um, and then the last thing that I'll mention is that uh, instead of um, doing something as simple as nearest neighbors, there are also approaches that do something more complicated where you do some, you kind of formulate this graph and do message passing on that graph in order to ultimately um, kind of figure out the relationship between different examples. Cool. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the gist of it for these non-parametric methods. Um, I guess to summarize, uh, unlike the previous examples, unlike black box meta learning and optimization based meta learning, we're not actually ever going to be getting an estimate for the task parameters. Uh, instead, we're going to be typically computing some embedding space and then doing nearest neighbors in that embedding space. Yeah. Does it converge quickly in, in data sets or something? Yeah, so one of the things that's really nice about this class of methods is that. Uh, this, this process is entirely feed forward. So you, you kind of compute your embeddings in a feed forward manner, and then you compute your prototypes, and then you do this, this kind of distance function. Um, so it ends up being, like you don't have to do any sort of gradient descent process. Um, it ends up being pretty lightweight and pretty fast to train. Uh, and so you'll see in homework, um, in homework two that 
this class of methods can actually be quite nice for, for classification problems. Yeah. Uh, message passing is the last idea. Um, so the question is, what is message passing? Um, I, that's, going into that in depth is beyond the scope of, of what I'll cover in lecture. Um, message passing is a, um, but I guess very briefly, um, you can think of message passing as if you have a graph um, of kind of, in this case, a graph of different examples, um, and you have some kind of uh, some notion of like how these examples are related to each other. Like some of the examples maybe have a very strong relationship. Some of the examples have a weaker relationship. Uh, message passing algorithms basically try to um, pass messages along the edges of that graph. Uh, and you iteratively pass messages in order to um, ultimately try to converge to um, kind of some notion about the, the kind of true relation between these examples. Um, but I encourage you to kind of, you can read this paper for more detail. There's also, um, if you take like Stefano's course on deep generative models, he also, I'm pretty sure, covers undirected graphical models and things like message passing there. Yeah. Sorry, which was it that you said didn't require gradient descent? So none of these methods require gradient descent at meta test time. Um, all of them require a form of gradient descent in order to optimize your, your objective, to optimize your embedding space. Cool. Um, so I'd like to kind of run through a case study of actually using this algorithm in practice. Um, I put one example of a previous year's case study on the slides um, that was actually in a pretty cool healthcare setting where they're looking at image classification of um, trying to classify different skin conditions and skin diseases. Um, but the case study that I want to cover this year is an example in education uh, that I'm pretty excited about. Uh, I'm a little bit biased because I was involved in the effort, but uh, I think education is a really cool application area. Um, and I should also mention kind of at the start of this project, we really had no idea how hard the problem would, like how hard or easy the problem would be. and so. Um, yeah, it was kind of rewarding to see, see how it went. So um, the problem that we were looking at is uh, the feedback problem. And as one instance of this problem, uh, there was a course offered by some folks at Stanford called Code in Place, similar to Shelter in Place. Um, while you're sheltering in place, you could uh, code in place. <laughs> and it was a free course, free intro to computer science course. Um, and in the second iteration of the course, it had uh, more than 12,000 students from more than 150 different countries across the world. Um, and in the course, they gave a kind of a diagnostic exam to help students understand where they were at with the material. And they wanted to be able to give feedback on the diagnostic. And um, what the diagnostic was is students submitted open-ended Python code snippets um, that was trying to solve different problems. And uh, they estimated that if you were to try to give feedback on all of the students' code, um, it would take a very long time. Uh, in particular, it would take you more than eight months to try to do that. And so for this reason, actually, in the first iteration of the course, they didn't give any feedback to students on this diagnostic. They just took it, and then they got to see what the solutions were. We tried to see if we could give feedback to the students. Um, now, there's a way to formulate this as a classification problem. Uh, and in particular, on in many of the courses that you've probably taken at Stanford, um, when you submit an assignment or an exam, uh, you get feedback through a rubric, which tells you what kinds of misconceptions you made on a given question. And we can formulate rubric grading as a classification problem where the input, the x example, is the open-ended Python code. And the label is um, corresponds to basically filling out the rubric. Uh, and so each rubric will be a multi-label classification problem where you need to be able to predict whether or not the student has that particular misconception. Now you might think, well, okay, th if this is a classification problem, it must be pretty easy to solve because like classification is, is pretty straightforward uh, with machine learning. Um, but the challenge with it is that um, first we don't have that much annotation data. We don't have tons of data on the internet that tells us like feedback on student programs. 
Um, there's also these long tail distributions where students will solve problems in many, many different ways. Uh, and then lastly, and perhaps most importantly, uh, every time you give an assignment or an exam, usually it's somewhat different from the previous time that the exam or assignment was given. And so as a result, the, and then also oftentimes the TAs are different, the instructors are different and so forth. And so um, you don't have kind of a, a static data set or a static problem. Um, you actually have lots of different assignments, exams, rubrics, student solutions, and so forth. Cool, so does anyone have any ideas for how you could frame this as a meta-learning problem? I guess to start off, the kind of the meta-training data set that we have available to us is four final exams and four midterms from CS106A. Um, this has a number of different questions and each student solution has feedback from a rubric. Yeah? I guess you can look at it question by question, and then for each question, you have like the rubric, and I guess like each type of like task within the rubric would be like a task for the model. Yeah, exactly. So you could go question by question, and um, essentially each item on the rubric can correspond to a different task, where you can formulate kind of each, for each rubric for each question will basically be a different task, and your goal is to very quickly um, be able to give feedback on that rubric item with a small amount of labeled data. Um, and so each rubric has several items um, and every question has possibly its own set of rubric items and options. And so for that reason, you can basically have each rubric item as a different task. Um, so if, if you had a string insertion problem and your rubric looks something like this, where maybe um, one option is for the solution to be perfect. Another option is for the, um, for the student to kind of incorrectly, um, incorrectly insert the wrong character and so on and so forth. Then each item here can be just a different task for running meta training. And then once you have all these tasks, um, you can apply the meta learning algorithms that we've looked at in the class. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna apply prototypical networks, which is what we talked about on the last slide. Um, there's also a typo in this equation again. Uh, and X corresponds to a sequence of discrete tokens. So it's going to be, in this case, Python code um, or pseudo Python code, depending on how good the student was. And the embedding function, because uh, it's going to be text, we're gonna use a BERT-based model um, called the Roberta model that's going to take as input the Python code and output an embedding of that Python program. Um, and then unfortunately, uh, when we use prototypical networks out of the box with the Roberta model, uh, it doesn't do very well. And so uh, attention isn't quite all you need. <laughs> and um, there were some tricks that we needed to get it to work a lot better. Um, the first was that instead of only using the tasks from the rubrics in our data set, we can augment those tasks with other tasks that can be constructed in a self-supervised manner. So um, we can construct a task, for example, by predicting the compilation error that Python returns if you try to run the program. Um, we can also construct tasks similar to masked language modeling where you are trying to predict the token that has been masked out. Uh, and that can also be formulated as a classification problem where you want to classify whether or not that token is a for token or an in token and so forth. So that's going to augment our data set um, significantly. Another thing that we can do is instead of only giving it a few examples, we can also incorporate side information. Uh, so we have information about the name of the rubric option as well as the text of the question. And we can basically pass this into the embedding function uh, to inform the network what the task might be. Um, and so when we encode the program here, um, we're also going to prepend the site information, um, which will also be encoded with a, a BERT-like model. Um, great, and then the last trick is um, instead of only using data from the exams and assignments that I mentioned before, we can also use a pre-trained model so um, instead of randomly initializing the Roberto model, we'll pre-train it on, um, with a model called CodeBert that was pre-trained on a ton of unlabeled Python code uh, from the internet.
Cool. Um, so the gist of the method is still prototypical networks. It just is that there's kind of three small changes to it. One is that we are using these additional tasks. Um, the second is that we are incorporating the side information into the embedding. And the third is that we're going to pre-train the weights of the encoder. Um, as a whole, the model looks like this, where we have our side information that's encoded and prepended into the transformer layers. We embed the student code um, into embeddings, and we'll then average those embeddings to form a prototype for each, um, for each label for each rubric option. And then we'll train the whole network end-to-end um, -end initialized with the code bird model. Cool. Um, so how well does this work? Um, our first results were actually just offline on held out exams and held out rubrics from Stanford data. Um, we found that first it outperforms supervised learning by 8 to 17 percent, which is fairly significant. Um, 8 percent in the held out exam case and 17 percent in the held out rubric case. Um, in the case where you have a held out rubric, is actually more accurate than a human TA. Um, it turns out human TAs are actually not that good at at grading. Uh, it's actually really, like grading code actually just involves debugging the code itself. And so, um, yeah, it's actually pretty hard. Uh, but there's also a lot, still a lot of room to grow in terms of the held out exam. Um, held out exams are harder than held out rubrics because they might involve tokens that were unseen during training um, because of um, kind of the questions and, and, and things being entirely new. Um, the more exciting thing was actually trying to actually deploy this at Code in Place. Uh, in particular, um, this, a lot of this was in collaboration with Chris Peach, and Chris Peach promised the Code in Place people that we would uh, give them feedback on their, um, on their diagnostic. On May 10th, the students took the diagnostic, uh, and I think we had about one week to give feedback on all the assignments, or on all the solutions. Um, Alan and Chris made a cool UI that looks like this, where um, we paired the predicted rubric option with text that describes the feedback for that rubric option, and that was presented to the student in this purple box here. Um, the students then evaluated the feedback, whether or not they agreed with the feedback or disagreed with the feedback. Um, and we also tried to use attention to highlight where, um, where the algorithm thought the error might be arising from. Um, and it's lastly worth mentioning that things like syntax errors can prevent unit tests from being useful in giving feedback. And so um, there are some, some data, some solutions we were able to give feedback automatically to, um, but a lot, the bulk of the solutions we we're not able to give automatic feedback on. Yeah. Is there any additional things you need to do in order to get um, the model to pay attention to places where the student might have gotten it wrong? Specifically for the highlighting? Yeah. Yeah, so the highlighting, it worked, um, I think it worked a pretty good amount of the time, but it didn't work 100% of the time. Um, the way that we did that, I, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend this, but the way that we did it is we kind of randomly um, masked out part of the input and then tried to see if the prediction of the model changed. And if it did change, and that's kind of an indication that the error may have occurred in that part of the program. Um, but it wasn't the most reliable, and in general, interpretability is a, a very kind of open area of research in deep learning. Yeah. Uh, was there an ablation study to see which one of the tricks helps the most? Yeah, um, so there's a pretty detailed ablation study. I don't have them in the slides here, but you can take a look at the paper to see it. Um, the gist is that actually all of them helped a lot. Uh, and the three that I covered, um, I think that they were helping by upwards of 10% of um, accuracy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, can this model like, kind of also understand the logic and edge cases other than syntax too? Like when, when a student makes an error with like an edge case or something like that? Yeah, so the question is, can this model also understand if students like kind of edge cases and so forth? So it's only going to understand the kind of the rubric options you give it. Uh, and so if there's something that's not on the rubric, it's not going to understand that. Um, and it, it also still needs a few examples of at, at test time um, for the rubric. Um, cool, but so let's get into the, some of the results from actually the live deployment. So we actually gave this to the students uh, in the Code in Place course. Um, we got humans to actually volunteer to give a 1,000 uh, 
feedback or feedback on a thousand different student solutions. And then we had the system give feedback on the remaining 15,000 solutions. Um, and then around 2,000 of the solutions could be auto graded and then we, they weren't included in any of the analysis. Um, and then in terms of giving the feedback, um, for the, the 15,000 that were graded by the system, um, that's the feedback that the students got. For the 1,000, they got the human feedback. The students didn't know if they were getting human feedback or um, AI-based feedback, although they did know that we were running a study um, as part of the process. Uh, first, we looked at how much the students agreed with the feedback from the kind of prototypical network space system versus the human feedback. And uh, we were actually somewhat surprised to see that they actually agreed with the feedback from the system slightly more. Um, so, and, and also in general, they agreed with the feedback a lot. Uh, so in general, it was like, I think it was like 97 versus like 98% or maybe 96 versus 97%. So uh, it seemed to work actually quite well. Um, now, they might agree with the feedback, but not actually find it useful. For example, if you always said good job, they might kind of agree with that, but not find it very useful. And so we asked them how useful they found the feedback out of this kind of a rating from one to five. And they gave it a kind of a 4.6 out of five in terms of usefulness, which suggests that they actually find it useful in pointing out their misconception. Yeah. The AI gave, gave feedback on 15,000, but not all of the students would have responded with yes or no, right? Some of the students would not have responded at all. So is it like, is the same combined bias because it went to more students, it went to something, so there's this of like gave or label. And for the 1,000 students, it was like unlikely to get the students to like give the feedback properly. So, it's like, so you're asking what about students who didn't give feedback on the feedback? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, so first the students didn't know if it was human feedback or not, and so this comparison should very much hold water because they're not gonna just they're not gonna like abstain at different rates. Um, the other thing that we did is in the interface, we gave the feedback one by one, and to go to the next one, to actually see the feedback for the next question, they had to give feedback on the first question. Uh, and so we yeah, we required that they kind of stated whether or not they agreed with it or not. Um, it's possible that not all students actually looked at the feedback. Um, I don't know exactly what the rate of that was. Yeah. Did experts also grade this, apart from the students, by any chance? I'm so sorry. The humans here were actually kind of um, basically volunteer TAs for the course. Look, I meant the AI feedback. Uh, did any experts also review the feedback and uh, said whether the feedback would be useful or not. Got it, got it. Yeah, we did not have um, experts look at the feedback. So th these were the only evaluations that we ran. Yeah. Is there a difference in the usefulness found between the AI feedback and the human feedback? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I think the answer was no. And I should mention that the in some ways this is like kind of a hybrid human AI system in some ways because um, this text was written by Chris, actually. Uh, and so it was, it was doing the bulk of the work, which was to figure out which rubric item it was. Um, and then for each of those rubric items, Chris wrote that text. And the, the text from Chris was, was put in the box. Um, this still saved like almost all of the work needed to give feedback, because Chris just needed to enter that text for each of the items in the rubric once. Um, but I think that because of, because it's very similar, I wouldn't expect there to be a significant difference in usefulness. Cool. And then the last thing that we checked, just as a sanity check, we weren't really expecting to see any bias, but we wanted to check that um, that the model wasn't picking up on something that we wouldn't be aware of. And so we looked at the agreement by different um, the two most common gender. Um, demographics and the two most common or the three most common countries in the data set and saw that there weren't any signs of, um, of bias. Uh, this was expected because we removed all the comments from the code and uh, really there probably isn't that much information in the code um, that reveals this sort of thing, but it's always good to do these sorts of checks in, um, in these kinds of studies as well. Cool. Um, yeah, so that was a case study of actually using prototypical networks in a real application. Um, we're also trying to kind of continue to improve on it. We actually have a little bit more data now, and so we're hoping to uh, improve that bar a little bit more. Um,
now I'd like to talk a little bit about how the different approaches compare. So we've talked about black box meta learning, we talked about optimization based meta learning, and today we talked about these more non parametric approaches. And I think it's useful to take a high level view to understand like when should you use one algorithm versus the other and how do they compare to each other. Um, first, we can compare them at a conceptual level. So um, we mentioned, we walked through this kind of computation graph perspective on meta learning in Monday's lecture. And we saw that both black box meta learning and optimization based meta learning are both a computation graph that takes as input the training data set and the test example and makes a prediction for that test example. Um, non parametric approaches can be viewed in the same exact way. Uh, so you can also view something like prototypical networks as having the same form of computation graph. Um, it's just what happens on the inside in the inner loop that differs between it. Um, and so in particular, the, um, the, yeah, it makes its predictions for um, test inputs using something like nearest neighbors or nearest neighbors to prototypes, um, where the equation for the prototype is kind of the average embedding. So as a whole, you can sort of view all of these approaches as being um, kind of the same family of meta-learning algorithms, and they're all optimized end to end with respect to some meta learning objective. The difference is just whether or not you don't give it any structure at all and you represent it as a neural network versus embedding gradient descent versus embedding something like nearest neighbors. Uh, and this also suggests that it's possible that there may be a fourth class of approaches that, approach that comes up that embeds something that looks a little bit different from these other methods. Um, and like we mentioned before, you can also again kind of mix and match different aspects of this computation graph and get algorithms that aren't clearly in kind of one of these three buckets. Um, so for example, there are algorithms that both kind of condition the network on the data and run gradient descent. Um, so that would be a hybrid between a black box approach and an optimization based approach. Um, there are also an algorithm that does something like relation networks, which we had talked about here, where you kind of learn this distance function um, and actually run gradient descent on that relation network embedding. And so that would be an, a hybrid between optimization based and non parametric based. Um, and then there's also approaches that do something like MAML, but initialize uh, the last layer as, um, as a prototypical network. Um, so I guess in general, I think it's useful and pedagogical to think about these three different categories, but there really is a, a spectrum in between these, and there's lots of algorithms that don't fall into one of these three categories super cleanly. Um, then beyond kind of the, beyond the conceptual uh, similarities between these algorithms, we can also think about the properties that they have. Um, one property that we've talked about a little bit is expressive power. And by that, I mean the ability for the learner to represent a wide range of learning procedures. Um, and we want to have expressive power because it means that we might be able to scale to scenarios where we have lots of meta training data and we want to learn a really good learning algorithm. Um, and it also means that it might be applicable to a wider range of domains where maybe we don't have good learning algorithms. Um, beyond expressive power, there's a second um, property that I think is useful, which I'll refer to as consistency, which is that um, Regardless of what you do in the meta training process, it would be nice if your learning procedure monotonically improved as you gave it more training data. Um, and this is useful because you might be, um, you might get a test task that's pretty different from your meta training tasks. And if you do get an out of distribution task, it'd be nice if your algorithm still does something somewhat reasonable on those tasks. And so this sort of property will reduce the reliance on having a large number of meta training tasks. And um, it should give you, um, in principle, somewhat better OOD task performance. Um, and you can kind of remember the, the kind of the performance that we looked at when we kind of increased, we made the task more and more out of distribution, and we saw that an algorithm like MAML, which is um, which is actually consistent, uh, does better than algorithms that are not consistent. Yeah. Is consistency the same concept as generalizability? Um, the question is, is consistency the same concept as generalizability? Um, I think that consistency implies that it will, that the algorithm should generalize better. Um, 
but not vice versa. You could have something that does seem to generalize well, but isn't guaranteed to improve with more data in expectation. Um, yeah, they're certainly related. Cool, um, so I think these properties are pretty important for a lot of applications. Um, we, and we can think of each of these algorithms within the context of those properties. And black box methods have complete expressive power but are not consistent. If you give them more data, they won't necessarily get better. Um, Optimization-based methods are consistent in that they reduce to gradient descent. And they're expressive if you give them a very deep model um, for supervised learning settings. Um, and then non-parametric methods are expressive for most architectures um, that, you, that you give it. Um, and under certain conditions, they can also be consistent. Um, essentially, you can expect them to be consistent if, the, um, if your embedding function doesn't compress too much about the input. Um, if, it compresses, uh, if it compresses too much, then it may no longer be consistent because you may have uh, two examples that are very similar to each other, but your embedding space doesn't actually put them as, as similar to each other because it kind of compressed away some of the details. Um, and then beyond these properties, um, I think there's always like, there's, there's other pros and cons of these algorithms as well. Um, we talked a little bit about the pros and cons of black box and optimization based methods in the previous lectures. And these were that black box is easy to combine with a variety of learning problems, but can be challenging to optimize and as a result be data inefficient. Um, optimization based meta learning algorithms have a positive inductive bias at the start of meta learning and they also are pretty good at handling varying amounts of K and large numbers of examples well, because you're averaging across those examples when you compute the gradient. Um, but they involve a second order optimization that uh, can be compute and memory intensive. Now for non-parametric approaches, um, they're kind of an entirely feed forward process. You never have this sort of gradient descent step. And so as a result, they end up being computationally very fast and usually pretty easy to optimize. Uh, in practice, people have found that if you have varying K, it's somewhat harder to generalize to varying K. I don't ha honestly have great intuition for why this is the case, but it's a, kind of an empirical observation that people have made in the past. Um, and also that it uh, can be difficult to scale to very large K. Um, the reason why it's difficult to scale to very large K is because you have to make, um, you have to make comparisons to all the examples in your training set. And in general, nearest neighbors and non-parametric methods don't scale to very large data sets because you have to, um, because the kind of the runtime of your algorithm is, uh, is O of n. Or, or, or o, of, o of n times K in this case. Um, and then the last thing which was mentioned before is that uh, these methods are entirely limited to classification. Um, yeah. Cool, so, um, and then I guess the other thing that I'll mention here is that on many few shot learning benchmarks, uh, if you tune these algorithms well, oftentimes you'll see that all three of these can perform quite well on those benchmark problems. Uh, I think this says a little bit more about the benchmarks than, than the methods. I think the benchmarks may just be a little bit too easy. Um, and I think that the met which method you use will depend on your use case. So in general, um, my recommendation is if you have a supervised classification problem, I think that non-parametric methods are, um, are, would generally be my recommendation because they're very fast and easy to optimize um, and they tend to work well for classification. Uh, but if you don't have a classification problem, then you need to use one of the other two approaches. Um, and usually in that case, I might recommend an optimization-based meta-learning approach. Um, and uh, there are a few instances where I might recommend a black box approach. Um, black box approaches I think are actually quite useful in scenarios, um, in, in reinforcement learning scenarios, uh, in part because we don't actually have good inner loop optimization methods for reinforcement learning. Um, and then lastly, if you have a ton, a ton and ton of data, um, things like black box approaches can, can make sense because they're so expressive. Uh, and because you don't care as much about data efficiency. And that's why we've seen things like GPT-3, uh, I think, be very effective with um, a black box model. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you exactly here mean by entirely feed forward? We are, we are doing a training. 
Right. right. So by entirely feed forward, I mean that at, at meta test time, it's entirely feed forward. So like the inner loop process is a feed forward computation graph. Um, and actually, the same could be true for a black box model as well, although black box models often may have some amount of recurrence. Um, but yeah, so I mean, in contrast to optimization-based methods where you're running gradient descent at test time, these approaches are just a forward pass through, um, through, things, through, through a neural network. Yeah. yeah so, so for all these meta-learning um, algorithms, we still need to have like, a bunch of, like a, a very large number of tasks that we can sample from IID. If we, if we have like a small number of tasks or generating a new task is still not expensive, so like we only have like dozens of tasks instead of hundreds of thousands, would you still recommend using multitask learning instead of meta learning or are there ways to modify them? Yeah, so the question is um, all these methods require a fairly large number of tasks and if you have a small number of tasks, um, would I recommend using multitask learning instead of meta learning? Yeah. So um, first off, I would say that in general, um, in settings where you have a small number of tasks, uh, things that, that, that's where consistency can be very important because if it is still running something like gradient descent on that new task, then uh, it is less reliant on having a large number of meta-training tasks. Um, the, and then there's, I think, two, others, two other things that you can do when you have a small number of tasks. Um, the first is that you can do task augmentation, which we saw in the education example. Um, in some scenarios, it's, it's, um, it's possible to come up with those kinds of tasks. In other scenarios, it might be more difficult. Um, and then whether or not to use multitask learning or meta-learning, I think is, um, it depends a lot on the particulars of the problem. Uh, the, in general, if there's a small number of tasks, I do think that multitask learning can be a, can be a better approach, especially if, um, especially if you don't mind training on all the tasks at once. Um, whereas in meta-learning, one thing that's nice about these meta-learning algorithms is you can train on all your meta-training tasks first, then kind of encapsulate that into a model, throw away kind of your, your meta-training task data, and then apply that to the meta-test task. So um, I think that generally the, um, whether you use kind of meta-learning or whether you use multitask learning will depend, uh, depend a bit on the considerations like that. Yeah. What is the proposed transformation? Then you say your code, uh, like for code, uh, every example. Uh, why do you prefer non-parametric over optimization based? Because I think user consistent. And is it just for the computer, or is it like there's other reason as well to pick it over optimization based? Yeah. So the question was, um, for classification tasks, is there a reason to prefer non-parametric methods over optimization-based methods? Um, and generally, my recommendation is just because of compute. Um, these will require uh, generally will typically require less compute um, during the meta training process. They'll also be a little bit lighter weight. And so in the education example, when we had, um, when we were processing Python code with these BERT based models, trying to do a bi-level optimization with a BERT model um, gets computationally expensive fairly quickly. And if you have a, a feed forward process, it's, uh, these computational benefits are quite nice. Um, but again, it, it, that's by kind of, default or rough recommendation, and there may be applications where um, an optimization-based method may, um, may be preferable, especially, for example, if you have um, like a larger K or a varying K or something like that. Yeah. If there were intermediates or there was a spectrum between these, what would be a combination between a non-parametric method and one of the other two? Yeah, so um, I mentioned one combination on the, on the previous slide. And in particular, what it was doing is it was, um, it, oh, I didn't mention on this slide. Which slide was it? So uh, these second two methods are kind of examples of hybrids of non-parametric and optimization-based methods. Um, for example, the second one, it actually kind of learns this embedding space and then does gradient descent on that embedding space. And so that's a little bit of a hybrid. I also think that matching networks itself is somewhat of a hybrid between non-parametric methods and black box methods because it uses this kind of bidirectional LSTM to encode the examples in the training set. Cool. Um, great, and then in the last eight minutes, 
Um, or actually, before we do that, first, um, there's also a third property which we'll talk about in a couple weeks, which is um, uncertainty awareness. Uh, in general, if you're in a, a few shot learning regime, there may be some ambiguity with respect to what the task is. And it'd be nice if the network would tell you, given the few examples that I have, I need more data in order to figure out a good classifier for this task. Um, and this can be useful in active learning settings and settings where you need calibrated uncertainty estimates, like in safety critical settings, um, also in reinforcement learning. Um, or if you care about uh, kind of deriving things from first principles from a Bayesian standpoint, um, this can also be useful. And we'll talk about uh, kind of uncertainty where meta learning algorithms in, actually it might be three weeks, it's either two weeks or three weeks in the, in the Bayesian meta learning lecture. Cool. Um, so in the last uh, kind of seven minutes, I'd like to just briefly run through a few applications um, just to give you uh, even more of an idea of the kinds of problems that these methods can be applied to. Um, and also, um, in some ways, some of these are actually somewhat creative and actually how they, how they use meta-learning algorithms. So in the first lecture, I showed you this video of um, doing one-shot imitation learning. And the different tasks corresponded to manipulating different objects. And the uh, kind of training example corresponded to a video of a human. And the test example corresponded to a teleoperated demonstration of, um, of that task. Um, the model here was an optimization-based meta-learning algorithm, so it was something like MAML. And one thing that was cool about this is that uh, when you have a video of a human, you don't actually have labels. Uh, you just have input images. You don't know what actions the robot should take. And so this approach actually used a learned inner loss function. Uh, and so instead of only learning the initialization of the model, it also learned a loss function that was used to run gradient descent in the inner loop. Um, and so this is an example of something where uh, instead of, yeah, instead of only op, like meta-learning one component of the system, you can meta-learn other components of the system as well. Um, and so kind of um, the way that this ended up working is that at test time you give it um, a video of a human doing the task, it runs gradient descent on this video with the learned inner loss function uh, to get a policy for the task. And then the result of running that policy on the robot is something like this, where um, it can successfully figure out that it should be going to the Red Bull. Um, a second example uh, is looking at pr predicting the properties of molecules. Um, this is potentially useful in drug discovery problems where you only have a small amount of experimental data for a given molecule. Um, the uh, the task is to predict the properties and activities of different molecules. Um, for example, you might have some experiments that are cheaper or easier to run, and you want to predict uh, kind of activities that are more expensive to run. And um, here they used optimization-based methods. They actually looked at mammal, first-order mammal, um, and uh, a variant of mammal that um, only updates the last layer of the model in the inner loop. Um, and they were using a uh, kind of a graph neural network as the base model. Um, and they found that these meta-learning algorithms were able to do better than uh, fine-tuning or k-nearest neighbors. Uh, and then the last application that I'll mention here is uh, few-shot motion prediction. Um, this could potentially be useful for human-robot interaction where you want to predict the motion of people um, or in autonomous driving where you want to predict the motion of other cars. And the task correspond to different users and different underlying motions basically different trajectories. Uh, and the training data set correspond to the past k time steps of motion, and the test set correspond to the future seconds of motion. Um, they use kind of a hybrid of an optimization and a black box approach here. Um, so they had this kind of learned update rule in the inner loop. And um, they were able to, uh, yeah, in this case, predict kind of the motion of these human skeletons uh, fairly accurately. Um, and we're able to do so much more effectively than a multitask learning approach or, or a transfer learning approach. Cool. Um, so those were just three applications that I think are kind of uh, survey the spectrum of kind of problems that you might look at in meta-learning uh, examples. Um, there's last, lastly kind of one closing note that I'd like to mention, which kind of gets at one of the things that we saw in the first application. 
um, which is that kind of so far, whenever we sample a kind of a train set and a test set, we've been looking at examples where we kind of sample them IID from the same distribution, and they don't actually need to be sampled independently from one another. Uh, the training data, the kind of the inner loop training data that you're learning from, it could have noisy labels, it could be weakly supervised um, and not actually have exactly the label that you want. Um, it could have domain shift that's different from uh, what you see in the outer loop test examples. Uh, and this is kind of cool because it means that you can actually kind of meta learn for learning procedures that are more robust to noisy labels, that can learn from weak supervision, that can learn from other forms of supervision than typical forms of machine learning. Um, and so, yeah, in general, the inner loop and outer loop don't have to be the same. Um, on this note, it is really important for the test set to be a well-formed machine learning objective because that's gonna drive the meta-learning process and optimize for that learning procedure. Um, but it's really the inner loop that can be uh, almost anything that you want in some sense, um, although you do need to have enough supervision and enough information in that inner loop for the model to be able to infer what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, this is true for black box too. So um, when you pass in your um, your examples, your X train and Y train, you could have noisy examples, like noisy labels that are being passed in, or you could have um, supervision that's a little bit different than kind of a one hot vector, for example. The reason I asked the question is, does domain shift mean the scaling and the shifting that was done for the mammal? Yeah, so for domain shift, um, kind of what I had in mind there is, um, say you want to learn a classifier uh, between like, Maybe you want to learn an image classifier and you want to be able to train an image classifier with like sketches of things um, so that if you give it like a sketch of a cat and a sketch of a dog, it learns a good cat versus dog classifier. Then D-train could be sketches and D-test could be natural images. Um, and black box methods could work well for that or, or optimization based methods or, um, or possibly things like prototypical networks. Um, I guess it, in that example, I would guess that Black box, in general, black box methods could actually be a better choice in some of those scenarios because it is very expressive in the learning procedures it can learn. Um, and like for things like, but, but yeah, in general, like expect kind of uh, all the algorithms that we've covered to be able to handle these kinds of things. Cool, um, so that's it for today. Uh, we talked about non-parametric um, few shot learning algorithms. We compared the different approaches. Um, this is the last lecture on meta-learning algorithms. And next week we'll talk about unsupervised pre-training methods and also a little bit into how these relate to meta-learning algorithms and how you can view some of them in a similar light. Um, and then there's also some reminders about coursework on the right. <laughs>